And Tyler, tell us what, what is this building we're standing in front of right now? So this is a classic self-storage conversion. This is actually a existing pole barn that was used commercially for many different uh, businesses over the last several years. When we purchased this back in November, just about seven months ago, um, we purchased this as a distressed commercial site um, that has a couple acres out here in the parking lot um, as well as the building that's here existing. And uh, we turn it into uh, self-storage. So, so how many units are in this? So this building is 10,000 square feet. We were able to do a unit layout mix of 78 units. And uh, the unit mix is some sizes are 12 by, by 20. There's some 15 by 30. Uh, we have them um, even as small as five by five. So we did a pretty even layout mix. And Jaren, if you step out here and if you look at the building, so based on the different parameters that you have within your local city, um, just codes uh, to be compliant, uh, when you get into conversions, if you don't already have a water sprinkler system or if you don't already have a functioning building within that zoning, you have to become compliant. So with this site being 10,000 square feet, this did not have a water sprinkler system that is necessary within commercial unless if you can find ways around that. So what we did is we took this building that measures 200 by 50, we split it up into four quadrants. So each quadrant is independently ran with one door entry for each building. Now, when we go inside here, we're gonna have hallways that wrap around. And around these hallways, it's gonna have a unit mix, all varying sizes. And the idea of doing this was we have firewalls that quarantine each unit, and it helps us not only keep control of our guests that are there, but it's also a way of making sure we're compliant with fire code regulations, as well as figuring out a way to uh, contain uh, just the storage facility as a whole. So how did you decide on the unit mix in terms of like how many of this size versus that size? Yeah, so this is another really good question. So at the end of the day, it wasn't me who decided this. So when I had this building, there are so many decisions that I had to make, just like anybody with a conversion, that that's really the last thing that you're gonna know when you're going through all these different loopholes. So what I did was I partnered with a self-storage business that specialized in doing the unit mixes of the inside. Hmm. So I originally came to them with a layout of what I wanted and they said, hey, we can do that, but if you let me do this, I think I can get you more units with more diversity. And how did you find that company? So I found that company by just researching online um, for different people that are within the self-storage industry. And in that case, I went with a company called Janus uh, Manufacturing. And uh, it was interesting because since they've been through the grind so much, when I gave them the dimensions of the building to show them what I was working with, um, especially within conversions of existing buildings, it's very easy for them to come up with odd size units. And when they do that, they can, they can really stack them in there by having different sizes. Yeah. I know you sort of explained why there are these yeah, four yeah. doors. Why not just have a bunch of different doors directly into the units? Okay, so since this is a climate controlled facility, we opted for doing climate controlled to deal with fewer problems. So climate controlled facilities tend to, to pay out um, anywhere from a third to two times the amount what a normal drive up storage facility would. Okay. But with that, you have a lot of inefficiencies because you have heating and cooling that take place year round. So when dealing with heating and cooling, having to deal with efficiency, not only do you have to keep your building insulated, but I also wanted to get rid of extra doors and extra windows. I wanted to keep this place as airtight as possible. So now that we have one entry point for each quadrant, not only do we get rid of all the draft and airflow, but we really prevent um, just wasting energy. And then climate controlled means there's actually air conditioning yeah. and heaters. So there's air conditioning and heaters, um, but really climate control is about the moisture in the air, making sure that it's an acceptable temperature as well as moisture sense. level. So yeah, humidity probably messes with people. But, yeah. It does, yeah. So with with enclosed storage, you're gonna have a lot more valuable items that's most likely going to be stored inside, such as TVs, electronics, or even like collectibles, furniture. And it's not gonna decompose as it would with fluctuating temperatures outside mm. and humidity. Yeah, that makes sense. Tell us what you just told me about this gate. This, this is, uh, do people have a card or something? Or how do they get in that? Yeah, so we, uh, 
when developing the site, um, especially with this not being a staffed facility, I was really trying to figure out a way to simplify the management of this and control, since I won't be here, uh, and operating this independently from home. So this site is controlled by two gate access. Uh, right now we're sitting on the exit, so there's only one way out of this facility, and that's through this gate. There's no way to enter through this gate, it's only an exit. Uh, right now Jaren's standing on the exit loop is what they call, so it's sensor by a vehicle weight and some type of magnetic motion detector. And this is the only way to get out of the facility. So you said there's a sensor right here? Yeah, so oh, yeah. when you drive over this, it's magnetically uh, triggered by the motion or some type of electrical frequency, and then it'll open up this gate immediately. The gate that we came through has one keypad. It's only an entrance gate. There's no way to exit through that part of the facility. That gate has an independent code for each client who rents a unit here. The moment a client is delinquent on payments um, or a client that has moved out, that code will no longer be used because it will be uh, non-existent. It just shuts it off. And that was a way to keep us from having to come here to double lock units when we're not having units that are, that are current on rent payments. So it was more of a way of controlling without having to spend the time to come here to manually go through the facility looking for empty units. That whole system, is that something that Janice helped you set up or we did that for you? So <clears throat> the security systems that we went through, the precautions anyway, this was all a local vendor using uh, for the fencing as well as the gate operators. So this was more of something that they talked about online, but this is definitely something that you would find uh, and hire out locally, um, as well as any exterior remodeling. If it's not self-storage um, um, exclusive, then you're pretty much gonna be stuck with an independent contractor in your local area. And bear with me, like, I don't really know what to do. Originally, we bought the, I bought this because I was gonna pre-lock every unit. So these are the locks that they recommend to use when you want to pre-set up your facility with each unit being locked, and mm -hmm. then you can control where your clients, what units they're going to take. So mm -hmm. they don't uh, they don't rent a five by five, but then go take a 10 by 30. Oh, okay, interesting. They were bought specifically to pre-lock every unit and for that just to be assigned to the next client. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's a lot more managing, sure. and we don't want to do that. Okay. Each lock can be independently changed, and so I was just offering it as an additional service if they want to take them. Mm -hmm. So going back, you would not do that? Yeah, no. Okay. I would tell them to go buy their own lock. Okay. They're in the lock business. So I can see what you mean, how Janice kind of like, yeah, they, besides, basically what, however they could fit the most in here. Yeah, so like you get units like this. Yeah, so then all the units have open ceiling tops. They call this jail bar. So. As we go over to the other side, we'll see the 30,000 BTU units that heat and cool this facility. Mm -hmm. But that way the air circulates through here. Mm -hmm. If you look down at your feet, you'll see the lines. These guys from Janus were very specific. They chalk line everything out, and then everything is dimensionally sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it was like a week and a half. And they so, so this is the out. size I would need to put my cash, right? Yes. Okay. So right. then, so how much did it cost, like, what was the dollar amount to install all 78 units like this? So it comes out, for doing this whole facility, with everything it came out to around, just over $7 a square foot. Okay. Um, it probably would have been $7 a square foot had I not um, increased the project size. I had all of the, the interior walls in this entire facility reskirted rather than doing finish work of closing them all off so you'll see all the new galvanized steel and it will be directly behind this unit so behind all these walls is raw insulation but we didn't do any painting we didn't do any drywalling we didn't buy any more material to film out we literally just had janice come in here and they skirted out the entire building mm -hmm. including the firewalls so is this ceiling original? Ceiling's original. Did they put light pictures are all original? Mm -hmm. We swapped them out to LED, mm -hmm. but where it was meant to take existing key, yeah, um, 
all the ceilings are insulated with cellulose. Mm -hmm. Cool. So with this facility being climate controlled, it was really important um, to figure out a way to do this efficiently with installing something. So rather than going um, with duct work and running some type of central air system throughout the facility, since all of the units here had the gel bar netting for the ceilings, that means everything's open, it's just contained in each individual unit. But we opted for a mini split units. So this one mini split can handle this entire quadrant oh, okay. since it's already petitioned off from the other units. This is a 30,000 BTU unit along with a three ton air conditioning unit outside that will heat and cool this place between 40 and 80 degrees year round. Um, so it's automatic, so it kicks on and off. And uh, it worked out really well because how Janus does their enclosed units, they're all open mesh ceilings. So um, doing this, uh, we didn't have to go through any of the additional prep and site work of doing duct work and running different vents and air returns. We could do it all right from a central location. Every single unit you've opened so far has been a different size. How do you decide how much this one rents for versus yeah. is it just whatever the square footage is? Yeah, so, well, first of all, <clears throat> when you're doing conversions, that's when I was mentioning earlier how you can have a varying in sizes, and they're gonna do that based on the unit mix layout, whatever makes the most sense for maximizing your rentable square footage. This was done by Janus, they did the layout, and uh, they also installed. Now when it gets to pricing, it gets a little bit complicated, because the easiest way is to look at your competition and see what kind of units they have, and figure out what they're rented for. Most people are conventional sizes, five by five, five by 10, 10 by 10, 10 by 15, Whereas I have some five by seven and a half, some eight and a half by 12 and a half, some 10 by 30s and whatnot. So that gets a little bit tricky, but really it just comes down to just doing math and you just want to have it as a sliding scale. If you get a feasibility study done, they will help. But then again, that only works when you're comparing apples to apples. So when you're having units that might be a little bit bigger than a 10 by 10, but not by much, that's when you need to just kind of play with the numbers, divide them out, and just figure out what kind of increments, um, plus or minus, you need to be. I assume there are other storage facilities in this area, right? So like, how do you convince somebody to come here instead of there? Like, are you pricing lower, or what's your angle? Yeah, so there's different angles to go. Probably the only advantage that I will have at this specific facility is, since it is a smaller facility, for example, this building's only 78 units. Um, I had the location going for me, and also I only have 40 feet to the farthest unit from the entry point. Whereas a lot of larger complexes, you might have several hundred feet to get to there, whether it's upstairs on an elevator, up a staircase, or if it's wrapping around hallways. So really it's just about how centrally located the unit going to be for the guest. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the traffic count is on this road out here? Yeah, so traffic count's important for this specific area. I think it's situational depending on your area. My traffic count is around 12,000 people. I have three self-storage units within two mile radius. The other three are all pretty stacked with clients. So because they are all maxed out with their capacity, I think there's more than enough. We just opened up two days ago, so I'm excited to see the progression. Yeah, I mean, I would think that's stabilized. A, probably a big clue that there's still a, a need if they're all maxed out, right? Yeah, that's that's the goal. Yeah, and as you've been telling us, the goal is not only to make sure it's feasible to pull one of these here, but also your location should be <laughs> ideal for regentrification. Yeah. So if they ever need to knock this down in the future, like the location is really kind of like your insurance, right? Yeah, so it's. For this specific spot, it was more about holding the location, making a cash flow for a long-term investment play, mm -hmm. um, while riding the coattails of consistent income. Yeah, and uh, we're really excited. We've got some more room to build. We're just trying to figure out what that means, and uh, I don't know quite yet. You want to get a view back out there by the parking lot? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, so when it comes to property management. What, do you have a company or are you doing this yourself? Like, how are you handling all that? Yeah, so <clears throat> I come from the background of rental homes and some of the reason why I did storage was because I was tired of dealing with property managers and I most certainly don't want to manage my own properties anymore. 
Um, so when I did this building, the whole reason why I went to the extent I did with the various site preparation was to prevent an on-site manager. I was able to find a company called Easy Storage and they manage this facility from Utah. Um, and this company that handles this, they take care of all the phone calls and inquiries. Um, and just to go on that note, that's a really big deal because a lot of mom and pop self storage facilities, they don't always answer the phone because they do have lives, but those guys don't outsource their phone because it's a retiree or it's somebody who's just doing storage on the side, he's working a day job, he can't take the call. And in storage, it's not necessarily a brand that gets you the, the, the client, it's more about just convenience and just trying to get it taken care of so they can move on. Mm -hmm. So we opted for easy storage because they answer the phones um, just about 14 hours for a full day's extent. They answer uh, Monday through Saturday. Uh, they're not open on Sundays, but they do have a voicemail system that's set up. Um, so they alleviate the whole congestion of phone calls and inquiries and a lot of monotonous um, extra questions. And then we also have a website through Easy Storage that has a very sophisticated management tool where you can rent your own units online. It'll also tender out a gate access code for the client. That way um, they can do this all with without somebody answering the phone. But we have the phones set up with Easy Storage just to take care of that piece. Um, so Easy Storage is managing the entire thing, very affordable. I think we have it just under $400 between the call service and the management uh, per month because it's under 100 units here at this site. So it's not a percentage, it's just if you're under, under 100 units, it's yeah. 400 per month? Yeah, so it's a flat rate. It's not based on a percentage of mm -hmm. rents. So, so if somebody... Like I was actually doing this with my brother one time where we came to his storage unit, the code didn't work, we couldn't get in. <laughs> if, if something like that happens or if, I don't know, a door is stuck or something like that, who do people call? <laughs> That's a great question yeah. <laughs> because I've been very <laughs> paranoid about if the gates wouldn't work, what is somebody going to do if they feel trapped? Mm -hmm. um, no, uh, to be fair, uh, the phone number is manned um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for emergencies only, but also during out Throughout the week, there is the call center that's going to answer within normal business hours. So if they do run into a situation where they're locked in here, they can contact the number on the board. It'll opt them to an emergency number, and they will be able to get out. Um, so, so that number on your billboard, if they call that, they're getting easy self-storage? They're going to get easy self-storage, or it's going to opt for an emergency line. Okay. So um, other sites will have side doors where people can exit the facility without going through a motorized opening. We don't have that here. I really don't want people coming here without being in a vehicle. Um, some of it is the way how we have our security system set up here. I want to know the license plates of the people who are entering and exiting. Whereas if we have people parking out on the road and walking in, we'll have no way to regulate who's in the, the facility. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this fence around the perimeter, I think you said that was like 25 grand or something. How vital is that for this type of operation? Like do you must have that or is it not that big of a deal? So with this facility being unstaffed and having an indoor facility, there's a lot more liability that you have when you have doors that lead in to a facility. Um, so just to be able to control who's here and to prevent any incidences, not only do we have the security cameras, but we really had to have the gates up here to keep people from walking in off the street if that would happen. Um, the last thing we want to do is jeopardize somebody's safety. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we spent just about $22 a foot just for the perimeter fence, and we spent an additional $3,000 to add a secondary gate. And this is all the precautions we took just to keep people out. So we have a six foot fence along with barbed wire around the perimeter. Is there a reason you didn't get armed guards with machine guns? <laughs> I'm concerned you didn't think that far. I know. Good. If zombies <laughs> attack this place. I could do a funny video on that. If we get into an apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> How many months did it take you from start to finish when you bought this thing to what it is now? So we took title on November 15th and uh, we just opened up May 1st. Um, we would have finished sooner, but we ran into some issues with some contractors, not being honest. Um, so that's seven months total? Seven months. I was my own GC on this project. Um, 
it just kind of worked. It kind of worked its way in. Um, would, you, would, would you re recommend that to other people, or was that more trouble than it's worth? I think it depends on the person's experience and uh, the kind of time they have to devote to the project. Had this project not been a type of building such as this, I would not have taken it on myself. Uh, with this being a fairly simple project, being a 50 by 200 foot building, it was pretty easy to just look at it as a regular rehab of a home. But if you're dealing with a lot more um, space and a more complex site, um, I would definitely recommend a GC. And you have to use a GC if you're going through conventional financing. Um, that's a really, um, most banks are going to require you to use a GC for the credentials. Whereas when I started reaching out to banks, I was 75% done with the building already. And was this, uh, what was this thing zoned as? Like, did you have to verify anything before you bought it to make sure you could use it for this? Yeah, so with, um, when, when changing a, a use of a site to a different zoning, that's very time consuming. So I had to go through city council to change this from a B1 zoning to a B2 zoning to be compliant for self-storage. So this was originally a retail store outlet and then when taking it from that to self-storage, that's the same category as a car sales lot or a, or a gentleman's club. So mm -hmm. they all had the same B2 zoning and that was, a, that was pretty difficult to do. It took about six weeks and about $4,000 of attorney fees to help push that through. I always sort of think of self-storage facilities as, you know, like I have a picture in my mind of what that means. Usually it's like a class A property with like multi-floor or it's the drive up like big rows of storage units. But this just kind of opened my eyes in terms of, you, know, you really can take a building that was never intended for this and make it work. And that's, that's the kind of work I think a lot of people either aren't willing to do or they don't have the creativity to see the opportunity. So. Yeah, so I think this is just helpful for me and hopefully the RE Tipster audience to see what's possible if you're willing to get creative and do the work. Okay, so you've got this nice, beautiful parking lot, a lot of space here that just kind of came with the property. Do you have any plans for this? Is it like RV storage or what can you do with it? Okay, so when I bought this facility, it was for future expansion. Um, in this case, it's going to be immediate expansion. So we just finished the building, but I'm going to start investing in this piece now. Um, the big thing that we had that we ran into was figuring out what we could and could not do. We are located in town, so we have setbacks and easements to, to take into account. And with that, we also have drainage that we have to consider. So this site, when it was originally developed, did not have underground storage or any type of water drainage. So with that, we are trying to figure out the best way to develop this without flooding out the neighbors to avoid a future lawsuit. Um, so after doing the different types of numbers, there's definite ways to do unit mixes on this site to do multiple, multiple drive ups. But again, we've already talked about that before. We have a lot of supply of drive ups here. Um, when we say drive ups, drive ups mean? are smaller units that are accessed from the outside. Mm -hmm. So each individual unit is outside, it just okay. has a garage door separating. So out here, the, the best way to maximize the space. Um, to make sure we have a sufficient um, demand for the units would be enclosed RV self-storage. So the bigger units, so we're gonna have fewer units, um, higher paying units, similar to climate control, we have fewer units, they just pay better than regular drive ups. Mm -hmm. um, with that, we had setbacks along the entire perimeter of the property, um, as well as the front, we have to be 50 foot off the road. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a 35 by 220 foot building with 14 foot eaves to accommodate class C, class B RVs, as well as boats. And the way how it works is we have an entry point that they will drive around and we're gonna actually do 60 de degree um, drive up units. So what that will allow is while we have the flow of cars coming around the corner, it'll make for easier backing up because if it is 90 degree parking within these enclosed units, we don't have enough parking lot here. We have about a hundred foot width and we can only build on 85 feet of it after you take into account our easements. So when you're doing 60 degree parking, you actually can back up a full size RV within 35 to 45 foot of parking lot space. Whereas 
if it was 90 degree parking, you would need usually one and a half times the size of what you're actually backing up. Now, with something like boats and RVs, I mean, couldn't that just be outdoor storage? Like, why build anything at all? Why not just give them a parking space? Yeah, so it goes back to your region and where you're located. Here in the Midwest, we get quite a bit of snow, we get very harsh sunlight, and we get lots of rain, stalls, and freezes. So, bigger toys can decompose pretty quick, and uh, we're hoping to be a value for people to be able to park. I know that this next expansion is going to be around 7,700 square feet and uh, we're doing the 60 degree parking. We're pretty sure we can use about 95% of that for, for rentable space. Whereas with climate control, we've lost around 25% to accommodate the hallways. Does uh, your competitors offer RV and boat storage and that kind of thing? So we do have, I have two competitors in my local market that do provide that service and they are they're completely maxed out every season. So we know there's a demand for it. It's a matter of how long that demand and what will that building be able to be used for if it's not storage later yeah. on. Does, uh, does that type of storage pay less money than this type of storage? So this type of storage pays better than RV and boat storage. Mm -hmm. But there's only so many customers that need climate control. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Lots of different variables to consider. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Cool, man. Well, it looks beautiful. Anything else we should know? Or? No, that's it, man. Cool. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to show us around. And if you are in Anderson, Indiana, there's an obvious place you can go to store your stuff right here. That's right. <laughs>